Welcome to our exclusive IFTA interview with uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Linda Rashke, a well-known uh, trader for uh, several decades and one of the key market wizards uh, as part of the Jack Schwager book. Really excited to have you um, at our online uh, conference. Linda, welcome. It is exciting to me, IFTA. I feel like it's an old school reunion, even though it's all online. Thank you. And, and last time we, we managed to kind of hear you share some uh, key insights was in San Francisco some years ago. Yes, that was a great conference. IFTA did a really nice job there. So great to uh, uh, have you back. And the subject of, of your presentation is probably the, the great launch point for our discussion here. Ah. Um, and so I'm just, just checking uh, the full title, A Treasury of Wall Street Wisdom, The Wisdom of Past mas Master Market Technicians Applied to the Future. What would be your key messages in, in that presentation without stealing too much of the thunder? You know, that title of the book, it, it's actually a title of the book, okay? A, a Treasury of Wall Street Wisdom. And that was the very first book I ever read on any of these great uh, technical analysts, starting with Charles Dow and Gann and Wyckoff and I mean Livermore. It was in my father's bookcase when I was a little kid. And wow. it was really uh, cool because it had maybe five pages of a very succinct little outline on each of these gentlemen who contributed to our uh, history of technical analysis and market culture. And it just drew me in. It was so compelling. I thought, oh, this looks like the greatest game in the world. And so that really peaked from early on. You know, I think I must have been in my teens. Uh, you know, my interest in uh, not just technical analysis, but the stories of these individuals. And so um, I find everything that I do today totally rooted in the classic technical analysis from 100 years ago. I'm very much a KISS type of person. Keep it simple, you know, just with the market structure and the swing highs and swing lows and, you know, the writings of Charles Dow and so forth. But with that said, you know, each of these people had their own way of organizing data and structure in the markets. If you think about, uh, for example, Elliot, you know, with his wave structure or Wyckoff with his uh, sequence of things that, you know, lead to a markup or a markdown, you know, um, even, uh, you know, Robert Rhea, who condensed the writings of Dow, added his own twist to things. So each of these people took the basics, but couched it almost like in a different semantics, even though they're all sort of saying the same thing. So I thought I would take a look at how they expressed their views of the markets and their philosophy with not just the market structure, but also trading, because most of these individuals also traded, you know, back in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, they were all actively trading. And given the light of what's transpired over our year, this past year, it really defies a lot of classic technical analysis on one hand, because it was this giant outlier. We had a radical event that was not foreseen by technicals or anything along those lines, you know, which was not just dropping a little pebble in the pond, it was giant meteor landing, you know, in the lake and the ripple effects, you know, we're still feeling, of course. And, uh, you know, one hand of the economy has done fabulously and you know, the, the digital and technology. And then there's a proliferation of these zombie companies, which, you know, would not be around today without some type of federal assistance or artificial support. You know, airlines are a great example, but yet we can't really afford to let those airlines go. So, you know, given the fact that there's some tools that perhaps classic, uh, you know, indicators uh, that look at market internals, you know, might have misread things, some things early on. If we go back and look at how these people organize their data, you know, how would they have actually traded this, you know, and what 
can we borrow from them that still holds up? And how does that lead us to seeing the next six months? I can't predict a whole lot further than that, you know? <laughs> I can't really predict too far unless we get the nice big juicy fat stimulus from the Fed, you know, which was obviously a big driver here. So it's a great um, way to, number one, bring us all back to our roots. We're all technicians at heart. We all love the markets and it all started with the uh, efforts of a core group of people that built the body. It's a great way to express the common thread that we all have together and uh, different people interpret, you know, things in different ways with the tools that we're given. But this is going to be my interpretation of things and how I then apply it to my actual trading program because I still actively trade in, um, I don't manage money anymore, but I actively trade in stocks and futures every single day. So I'm here in front of my screens, basically 10 hours a day trading, you know, eight hours in the morning session and two hours in the evening. And everything I do is governed by this same foundation. So perhaps I can give some insights as to the practical application, right? Because we know that there's a big variance between the technical analysis side of our field and the actual trading side. So there's a lot of gray area in between there. Well, you hit the nail on the head in terms of that crossover between analysis and trading. And, and maybe if we uh, take a, a few steps before unpacking that important point, I, I wanted to kind of uh, build on this, this, what seems to be a passion that you have for the historical roots of our discipline. Um, and to me, it's music to my ears and, and to many uh, kind of up and coming technicians wanting to follow the same footsteps of, of maybe yourself and other veteran technicians, but also those before, you know, uh, prior generations. What is it about history, history roots and some of those great technicians that you cited? What is it about their work that is just so timeless or, or so attractive to the work that you've developed all these years? Rawbacher, father of charts, you know, of, of charting formations, um, you know, Gartley with all the proliferation of volume work and uh, things like that. Um, first of all, most of these people were intimately involved with the markets at the time. Um, second of all, they were doing their work without the advent of computers. And so everything was done with observations pen and pencil and paper, you know, we didn't have all the distractions, you know, uh, Netflix and, <laughs> you know, things that pull us away from our medium. So I think it's, uh, they had a lot more time to devote to their craft early on. And um, so the foundation that they've laid, I think is truly durable and robust. In other words, the things that they came up with have held the test of time, you know, through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and it really comes down to how we go about organizing our data, you know? So they were all masters at um, providing a formal organization to the data, just like you would have, you know, a formal organization to a religion. You can have many different religions out there, but they all have some type of, you know, basic philosophy and premise. So each technician had their own way of organizing the data and it still is valid today. I mean, everything that was laid out, you know, from the concept of the sideways line and then that leading to, you know, a breakout or a breakdown, just simple concepts like that, you know, still serve the basis for all of at least my trading strategies. And, um, <clears throat> you know, some were more aggressive at astute pattern recognition, for example, if you read uh, all of Wyckoff's works, he actually was a day trader. People don't realize that, but he day traded stocks, you know, very, you know, uh, minutely there watching the ticks. But he was also keenly aware of the little patterns like springs and up thrusts, the little bull and bat bear traps, you know, 
So it's not all about continuation patterns and bull flags and stochastics, you know, there's a little bit more, um, you know, pattern recognition there. And some of these things are more difficult for the algorithmic uh, strategic, um, you know, routines that are programmed out there to recognize. So I want people to feel that either both as traders or investors that we still can have an edge, you know, because yes, we like to model things and quantify things with statistics. That's part of our process, you know, with the tools that we have now, but yet there is a whole school that you can be a wonderful technician and a trader even without that, you know, so it's uh, just makes a great transition from a hundred years ago to now. And um, yeah, so it's, and then, you know what, they're all such amazing personalities, you know, some of these characters, if you, uh, you know, you read about them and all, it's like, I hope this never gets lost in our history. And, uh, you know, even some of the people that have been with us in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but are no longer with us, you know, just add such a color to our field that you perhaps don't get in a lot of other fields. You well, know? to add to the, uh, the personality and maybe the, the analysis or trading style of some of the, the giants that you mentioned, I've got a quote here from Richard Wyckoff. It, it was in your book, uh, Street Smarts, way back when, speculation in the truest sense calls for anticipation. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, and that is something that experienced technicians and traders recognize, you know, that patience and that stalking and, you know, not being in a reactive mode is a very important part of the process. Now, now from a behavioral point of view, which, which in essence is, is the heart and soul of, of our discipline in terms of market psychology, but, but more so in terms of the trading side of things. So I'm kind of jumping ahead here onto your trading point, but in today's world, Linda, uh, with new traders, what is maybe uh, the biggest pain point you see or, or you imagine might be uh, for them? Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of building on the point of patience and selection and, and that, that discipline factor. Uh, what's your sense? I think that um, discipline's not a, a good word to use, you know, because it implies that we all have to be little perfect robots and that we, you know, make errors and mistakes. And of course we do. So I, uh, I strike that word from my vocabulary <laughs> when it comes to markets because it, uh, it makes us all feel like lesser than we are. You know, I make mistakes every day, both in analysis and trading. But I think that the uh, two variables for newer people are, you know, we all want to learn strategies and study the technicals and the charts and so forth. But the huge value in our field has come from that school of behavioral finance that really got going 20 years ago and the much greater awareness to the problems that cognitive biases create. And so many people, I think, are aware of some of our cognitive biases and every, bit, every individual falls into different little traps. And those tend to be what trip people up a bit, you know, developing some type of cognitive bias. And, you know, I'm not going to repeat them all here, you know, but even if it's just being influenced by the last bar, you know, you can show people a candlestick chart and ask them, you know, if the next bar should be up or down. And, you know, if the last bar was an up bar, 80% of them will say that it's going higher, you know, so it's, we're very influenced by the most recent data. And, um, and then people just develop little uh, things that they latch on to, you know, there's all kinds of things. And uh, so I think that really, uh, it takes a long time for a person to figure out where, you know, they are getting tripped up by their own cognitive biases and what are the tools that they can use to guard against that, okay? And then that's where a lot of the quantifiable models can be helpful, you know, to help us reframe things without a bias. Because face it, you can, you can show a bar chart to a lot of people and they're going to see what they want to see, right? <laughs> and even if you throw a bunch of indicators on it, there's a lot of times where indicators are not necessarily of much value. 
especially when you're coming to the end of a trading range and you don't know which way it's going to break out, you know? So um, that also learning context, you see, in our art of technical analysis, which it truly is an art, a good part of it is learning to place the proper tools and strategies in a certain context, you know, and that's just something that comes with time and practice and experience. Uh, what about the subject of, of temperament or, or otherwise known as nature or nurture, that age old question? You know, uh, I have seen people that have the best poker face and are wonderful uh, backgammon players and, and uh, bridge players and they do marvelously and there's nothing, you know, they're, they're totally unruffled. And then I have seen people that have a feisty temperament and get angry quickly and yell swear words and jump up and down, but somehow that also works for them. You know, they can harness that and tap into that energy. And it's a driving factor for them to get a strong enough feeling to put, put, you know, pull the trigger. Okay. You need to have something that's going to be a strong enough emotion for you to pull the trigger, either, you know, a technical signal that you'll react to or an artificial construct, you know, buy or sell stops that pull you in or, uh, you know, something like that. So I, I've seen, um, I don't think you have to have necessarily one type of temperament per se, just like we see uh, athletes, you know, you've seen athletes who are cool and calm and collected on the tennis courts, right? You know, and you never see them uh, get emotional. And then there's those that are throwing their rackets and getting fined by the judges, but somehow they, that, that catches up a drive. So uh, I think the biggest thing with the temperament is the, um, the time factor that people realize this is not a part-time job and i think if you have the passion and the drive and you know you put the hours that it takes to do your own research or your own study or those kinds of things i think that's going to be the number one determinant as to your success not necessarily temperament but that's my opinion <laughs> Well, hey, and it's, it's great to pulse check your opinion after all these years of experience. And, um, and it's been experienced both, I mean, in, in, in several roles. You, you've traded, you've been, on, you've been on, the, on, the, on the floor, and you've been a fund manager. How has you know, each of those roles influenced your experience? Well, um, when I was on the exchange floor, I was a market maker in the equity options. And so it was very much a strategic orientation from the beginning because, you know, um, we would always be hedged or somewhat hedged, you know, in our uh, operations. And so um, it wasn't that you were necessarily taking outright directional exposure. So it did take kind of a lot of planning and forethought. And uh, so it wasn't like I was in the S&P futures pit, you know, getting beat up by a bunch of guys. So, um, you know, um, it was a little bit slower paced and uh, took a lot of time to do your homework outside of the market hours, despite the fact that you were on the trading floor. And the other thing is that everything was mispriced in those days. So I think it was a much easier environment for a trader, you know, starting off to at least have some type of edge that doesn't exist nowadays. Everything's perfectly armed and in line with the options. So that sort of also gave you a little bit of a leg up. And then you can see uh, definitely there's some time of day functionality. The public would come in and pay the uh, stupidest prices, you know, right after the opening. And you can see that in markets, they open and you have a little bit more enthusiasm. And we used to call it the opening bulge, you know? So quite rapidly prices get bid up or sold off. Do they stay there? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So, you, and then, you know, the little counter trend time of day low where the specialist could get their inventory back. So um, I wasn't down on the floor for that many years. Um, and I thought the floor died out when I left. It managed to last another 10 years. So more than that, 15 years. But uh, I, th I think that it gave me an edge because um, 
just always going about things in a quantitative manner from the very beginning with the options pricing and conversions and reversals and boxes. And so it, right away, your mind is looking at things in more of a, you know, mathematical type of way. And, and I, I mean, I, I picked up in, uh, in, in some of your written work that there are kind of three key things to a successful trading system in terms of the trade psychology, the, the actual system itself, but then also the money management side, which you just touched on. And there's a lot of statistical work that you go through to make sure that the data actually works out. Right, right. Everything's a balancing act. You know, you don't want a data mine, but you want something that's going to be durable and robust. If you had too many variables, you kill that. And, and then everything's still about context, you know, different strategies behave differently in uh, different type of market environments. Yeah. Uh, is, a big part of the, 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 the conference will be also focusing on, on uh, as in the, the tail end of your, your uh, presentation theme, uh, the future. Um, of, of our discipline, particularly when we think about AI um, and, and machine learning and, and all the various kind of bells and whistles that have yet to come. Uh, what's your perspective having kind of uh, lived through so many different changes in our industry? What do you think about the future and, and how might that influence our discipline? I think that uh, the biggest changes we've seen have been uh, on the um, the urgency of uh, you know everybody having bandwidth and you know being technically savvy and so you have a much more urgent crowd you know off of the market openings or the session openings where wherever you are um and uh so the trends are much trendier you know they're not going to give you the back and fills like they used to so you get these kind of straight line markups and then when you start to consolidate, I think the noise levels are much higher than ever. And a lot of that commentary is based on Perry Kaufman's initial work that he did 20 years ago. And he was pointing this out to me and I've just seen this carried to an extreme. You know, that when there are the trends, you know, you're on board or you're not. You're not gonna get a pullback to get on board, you know. And then when you start to rotate and consolidate I mean, it can go on forever and just be incredibly noisy. So that's um, one, you know, key thing. Um, there was a second part to your question. Well, the, the uh, maybe the, uh, the... Where do we go from here? Okay, so I actually started doing neural networks back in the early 1990s. And I've had a lot of experience just with artificial intelligence. In fact, I just got um, finished with a project that I was doing a year and a half to Stanford graduates, both extremely um, well versed in, in AI. Um, and they wrote a lot of uh, video software for the internet, you know, uh, um, capturing uh, videos and like Snapchat type things and stuff that were faster than anything else out there. But they knew nothing about the markets, you know, but uh, they knew the data. So um, this was a pretty intensive project. So I think they were about as good as you could get. You know, we wrote everything on TensorFlow, which is open source code, and it takes quite a bit of work and so forth. And with that said, you know, a neural net is, or, or you know, AI is only as good as what you train it on. And so as the environment changes, it's gonna have to keep on retraining itself and go through a learning curve, just like a trader would. You know, there's a lot of, um, it's not the end all and be all. And uh, in fact, you know, this thing had about um, 250 days of straight gains. I kid you not, it was doing, we were doing it on the options ex uh, expiration. Actually, it was on options and futures, but uh, that's not trading days, that's for a year, okay? And then it just hit this pocket where it didn't recognize uh, it was with Tesla options, which were, it, you know, kept on saying that Tesla was going to uh, go way higher, and, and it did, you know, but uh, it wanted to buy these out of the money Tesla options, you know, uh, that were like $20, and they were weekly options, that's what it was trading, okay? <laughs> 
and it got its head handed to it, you know, in four days, like a 30% drawdown, you know, so there's like so many subtle nuanced things that you think, oh, it's just very easy to train it on the data. But when it comes down to the execution and the subtleties and the nuances, there's just so many variables out there. Um, you really have to be incredibly specific about what you are asking the artificial intelligence to do. And imagine this, if it were so easy, and let's just say we had a sum total of five market participants out there, just like you would have a world uh, poker game, right? Now you take the top five world poker players, or say, you know, eight, however many sit at a table, and you pit them against each other, okay? And the pots are like, you know, multi-million dollar pots. So imagine that's what our market becomes, where you have the top six, you know, multi-billion dollar hedge funds, all with, you know, 50 PhDs and super servers at their disposal, pitting their AI against each other. I mean, what, what's going to happen? You know, it's like, who's going to eat who and who's going to, you know, they're just all going to end up doing battles with each other and it's going to be a big old noisy mess, you see? So there's room for everybody in this business and people can't think that just because there are these other tools out there that they don't have their own edge. You know, I do know, I had monies invested with one fund, um, really super guys up in Toronto, Canada, you know, um doing stocks and it was 100 percent automated with ai and uh you know they knew what they were doing and it's been a very successful um successful uh fund for them but you know they're focusing on just one strategy just one style of trading looking for certain things in stock data that aren't necessarily pure technical things okay but the AI can still do sorting through patterns, you know, perhaps patterns of the CEOs or patterns of, you know, other things like that. So it can be a useful tool for pattern recognition. And that's what it is, you know, but you still have to train it, you know, and it's, it's not the end all and be all. Welcome back. We're uh, here with Linda Rashke again. Uh, picking up where we left off, uh, talking about uh, manual trading versus um, AI and algo and, and the work that she did at Stanford University. Uh, so you can tune back into that uh, session to, to, to hear more. Uh, but for now, uh, Linda, we started talking now about profit centers and, and this idea of kind of trading naturally being a business, uh, but also in terms of your process of, of actually um, having profit centers and diversifying in that framework sure so profit centers for me are nothing more than being a way to track individual strategies or individual uh, programs that i'm trading so that's what i do as i break up the markets i'm trading or the the uh, strategies into separate i call them profit centers and they might be categorized by different time horizons for example on my intraday scalping or day trading is that adding to the bottom line or taking away in terms of being a distraction you know what is uh, is it smoothing out the risk is it um you know, is, is it working? So I used to, I kind of looked at that on a quarterly basis for many years. Now I just know it intuitively, you know, and then I have a separate program that might be, uh, you know, trading uh, stock options around the opening, you know, on a very short time horizon. And then I might have a program that's uh, more driven around some of the models where it's in one day out two to three days later, you know, that type of model. So you know, on a quarterly basis, then you can analyze not only the profit centers to see where the bulk of your earnings are coming from, but also, you know, ourselves. So if I see that perhaps a, an individual profit center is not working, like, for example, I know if I'm looking to put on positions with a certain technical type of um, uh, condition, you know, with a holding period of, it could be like anywhere from a week to, to six weeks. Um, I know that normally my win-loss ratio is going to be about 55% for that particular program, you know, but if I see, for example, my win-loss ratio is way down and that profit center is uh, not profitable, 
then it tells me perhaps I'm trying to force something or I have a bias or, uh, you know, the market conditions aren't there and I can, but, you know, then there's been other times where I go look at my uh, profitability over the year and it was like, wow, you know, that profit center contributed for 80% of my bottom line, you know, because I caught a few, a few great, um, you know, position trades. So, it, you know, it, it's a, just a way of compartmentalizing things in your program and your strategies, because if you lump all the numbers together, and this goes even with just analyzing individual strategies, if you just lump all the statistics together, you get too many things canceling out, which offer uh, the nuances, give us a lot of information and feedback about our programs, about ourselves, that type of thing. And how would you describe your risk management process, uh, especially to, to many that are looking to formulate it themselves right here and now? Well, so the risk management that I do is in several capacities. I always have to, and I, I measure my risk by my equity curve. So that tells me if things are working or they're not working. And also uh, the way that I trade, I have to be mindful of correlation, you know, so it's not always the risk on an individual position, although um, that is an important variable. You always have to have a worst case, you know, scenario where you get out, but um, you know, I don't want to see big drawdowns on my equity curve. And so you have to be a little bit more mindful about correlation or exposure or these types of things. And then we can assess, you know, how much overnight risk are we assuming? You know, is there risk in our operations? Do I have good redundancy? You know, is there risk with ourselves if we're starting to get burned out? So, uh, and then also risk is like, the money management, okay? So part of the risk is money management. And money management, everybody thinks about it's uh, a, a um, in the context of losses, you see? But we also have to say, well, we need to have a certain percentage of big wins or per, a certain percentage of great trades, you know, to really uh, make our bottom line. And so you also want to be assessing, well, where can I be more aggressive? Where can I be more active? You know, where can I put on larger size or where can I add to a position? So that's a really um, important part of money management too, is when something is working, I need to capitalize on that. I can't afford to miss that opportunity, you know? Um, so, you know, that's a big neglected part of the equation that people overlook. It's a very dynamic process because we're always adjusting, you know, each data point. You know, it's not this linear thing. Okay, I bought on this date, I have this hard stop, and then there's this finite window type of analysis, this very linear thinking. It doesn't work that way. You know, it's, so you really need to be adjusting both, should I add or should I get smaller? Always, you know, on a data point type of basis. And that's simply saying that I'm not looking too far out in the future. You know, I'm managing according to the dynamics of the current market environment. Uh, uh, Linda, one of the trend questions we're getting from our IFTA members is, is kind of a, a day inside of, of Linda Rashke's kind of trading routine, but more specifically, how you deal with the extremes of, of market stress, whether it's market vol, uh, whether it's the whole kind of uh, cognitive bias, for example, loss aversion, how do you deal with it? And, and what, what's worked for you? What guidance would you share with others? Uh, you know, you, you're right. Dealing with the stress for me is a big issue because I tend to put myself, I choose to put myself under a lot of stress. You know, I don't have to uh, do a lot of the things that I do, you know, but um, I choose to put myself under a lot of stress. But on the other hand, you know, it's just as you would any professional watching you know, your diet, your lifestyle, uh, you know, not too much alcohol or coffee or sugar or you know those types of basic simple issues that could create cortisol or adrenaline and so forth um and then you have to have a physical way to release that so uh do something physical some people like to play tennis or golf i ride horses you know go to the gym um interacting with others you know outside of the business is important you know humor is important all these basic, simple lifestyle issues, because I do tend to put in maybe 80 hours a week, you know, 60, probably 60 hours a week at least. So there's not a whole lot of time, you know, 
elsewhere. I enjoy what I do. It's passionate, but you, but you can't sit in front of the screens 24 seven either, you know, so you, every individual needs to find their balance. And that becomes even increasingly important if you have a family, you know, responsibilities to children, so forth. So, but for me, it's, it's definitely uh, doing something physical each day. And um, I think that as we get older, we're more mindful, you know, about these things. Uh, and I've made the mistake uh, early on, probably for two decades of uh, letting myself hit that burnout point, at which case you invariably do something dumb. <laughs> right. So catches up eventually and, and one yeah, of the, so you have to know you know what works for you and so forth and and just a, a final point um in terms of routine which I, I read up on is it true and 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 if so how important is it uh, for you that that there's a gratitude practice that that you incorporate <laughs> well i pray to god for a lot of positions but <laughs> <laughs> no you know i mean um I can only speak for myself on a personal level there, you know, that I tend to have a, um, a positive outlook on the world. And I always want to see that the glass is half full, not half empty. And, you know, I do like, you know, reading books and positive uh, motivational type of material. And, um, I am blessed, you know, I'm, I'm so blessed with just people that I have in my life or my dog, you know, or, you know, having a beautiful orchid, you know, in my office or something like that. You know, everybody looks for the things that, uh, that work for them. Um, and, um, of course, one of the feature books that you're in uh, some time ago is Women on Wall Street. Uh, being a, a key contributor in that book uh, and being a, a well-known female professional in the industry, what words of insights uh, could you share with, with many professionals out there? Um, well, for me, as a female trader, it doesn't really apply. The gender issue doesn't really apply because, you know, it's a bottom line business in my field. So I'm behind the screens and, you know, people don't see whether I'm a male or a female. You know, I mean, obviously, when I had my hedge fund and I have clients, you know, they probably welcomed it, um, you know, if I was providing a diversification in some way because, I actually had a lot of money allocated to me from fund of funds, not necessarily individuals, but a fund of fund might have uh, perhaps 10 different CTAs or managers. And, um, you know, then they can go to their clients and say, aha, we've got a trend follower. We, we have a female, you know, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if that really matters anymore these days. I think everything's pretty much driven by the bottom line. And I'm sure on the institutional side, it might be com completely different if you have certain cultures, trading cultures, perhaps at a bank environment. But um, I don't think there's that many jobs anymore on the institutional side that are along the lines of a discretionary trader where you're really involved in doing the decision making process you know you're either there in an execution capacity uh monitoring the models you know or the mechanical program that you know the institution is following uh and i would say that 80 percent of the quote institutions you know tend to be uh more model driven you know as opposed to taking input from a discretionary trader. So, but for, there's a huge, huge market now of all us individuals that run our own business in one way or another, you know, either our own individual trading operations or managed money, or even in the capacity as an, as an advisory, you know, or a consultant, somebody that provides a content, you know, there's so many different hats you can wear in this business. And, and of course, you've been a, a, a key IFTA supporter, both a, a, as a member, speaker, but also APTA president. I, I wanted to make sure that we asked the question, uh, what's your view of, of, uh, of, of, of the IFTA work that you've seen and, and maybe what we can do in the future to strengthen our discipline? 
Well, I love the fact that you guys have this online Zoom conference. I would love to see an informal conference like this online every year. I know it's a lot of work to organize these types of things. Um, I used to try to go to uh, some of the conferences in different locations. Some of us have jobs that it's hard for us to take the time off to travel and be away from our, you know, our business. Uh, you know, it's easy to write a newsletter or something from any location in the world, but to conduct trading operations, it's different. So I love the fact that, um, you know, there's this online format. And I, I've met so many wonderful, inspirational people through these inter international organizations, you know, um, uh, people like Perry Kaufman, you know, really influenced my research early on 20 years ago. And I wouldn't have met some of these friends if it wasn't for like, you know, the old MTA, which is now a different, you know, wears a different hat or APTA or, you know, IFTA, um, Hank Pruden was a, was a very dear friend, you know, before he passed and he was very influential in the San Francisco Technical Society that had a joint uh, conference with IFTA in San Francisco, where you were. And um, it, so it, it uh, it's not part of the uh, bottom line profit thing. I'm never going to get a strategy from somebody else or, you know, that's not the point. But it's just, you know, all of us rubbing elbows with people that apply themselves and put in a lot of work into their individual product or discipline or, you know, field of technical analysis and trying to always do research. Maybe, you know, you get one little glimmer from somebody else's article or research that inspires you to, oh, let me, you know, I've got an idea for trying something out, you know, so it's that type of thing. It might just give you one idea and and then you go and you model something and it either is a dead end road or, you know, or you find something that might offer a little bit of an edge. So always having to get our ideas from so many different sources. And as a final thought, Linda, um, again, you, you, you've lived through the, your evolution of, of our industry and discipline. I mean, for a lot of people looking out into the future, what do you see as, as a potential future trend for, for, for what we do? Uh, what we do, you mean, uh, technicians, traders, the whole financial industry? Technical analysis discipline in particular, maybe the education side. Well, you know, I think it's just fabulous on the education side. There's so much online for free, honestly, you know, and, uh, just going back and making resources available, like the writings from a hundred years ago, you know, I mean, how many times can you draw trend lines on a bar chart, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? So it, you're, you're either doing just raw analysis in terms of looking at supply demand in functions, right? And different ways of analyzing that. And I honestly believe that everything was, that, that you could talk about has been written, you know, for the last 120 years, right? So, you know, there's a body, there's a good foundation there that people can use to build their models from themselves. So you're either analyzing just the raw basics of technicals and supply demand, or you're looking for some type of relationship in terms of is there an edge, a relationship, an arbitrage opportunity, a correlation, some piece of information, you know, that the market's telling you there's a, there's a supply demand imbalances, but in a different um, way of communicating. So for example, if you saw the relationship between, um, you know, uh, let's just look at yields, you know, from 15 years ago, or, you know, how many years ago, 13 years ago, you know, when the yield curve, when we had our, our, our rates drop below 4% for the long end of the curve in the United States here, I mean, we hadn't seen that happen for ages. And so you know, why was the market breaking out of this band, you know, this banded relationship, you know, where we could kind of fluctuate back and forth on the interest rates? You know, what was happening? Why were the bonds breaking out and making new all time highs like they were? So um, that's where it's always interesting then to say, okay, what's really going on here? You know, it might not make sense from, you know, we're so used to buy wholesale, sell retail, right? You know, having some type of range, a bounded range to work with. And so when you start breaking out of a bounded range with an indicator, 
um, a relationship, a correlation, you know, these types of things, um, it's, a, you know, it's a different type of analysis and it's not a, a constant, okay? It's recognizing that as somebody that has gained experience in the market, you recognize that this is a unique event. So back to that very much about putting things into a context. And a lot of times as technicians, we don't have the sample size to do that, you see? So um, then you have to say, okay, the market's telling me something. I don't know why it's doing what it is, but it's definitely telling us something, right? That there's this huge supply demand imbalance, which is what creates our bottom line opportunity. So um, then you need to, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, hmm. you know, there's certain things we can read about as technical analysis, but there's other instances like this. And so I think that there's always going to be room going forward for people that can have some uh, ability to recognize there's an opportunity here. See, it's like they don't sit there and ring the dinner bell for you, you know, when there's going to be a great, you know, long liquidation break or, uh, you know, a huge rally, you know, where all this cash on the sidelines, they don't sit there and ring the dinner bell. So I think that there's always room for the individual, you know, to um, add their input into any model on a discretionary basis. In other words, it's not just artificial intelligence or mechanical systems or models because I think that individuals have an ability to process changes in relationships that give us good information faster than our models and perhaps faster than artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is only training on past data. It only knows what you've taught it to recognize as a pattern, you see? So I think for our industry going forward, you have changes in terms of the uh, technology dynamics, which actually facilitate us, you know, uh, our ability to do a lot more things, you know, uh, but, but again, you know, this individual uh, color and personality that we can all add to the business, I think it'll always be there. So. An, an inspiration uh, to, to consider, I think, for all the people watching this, that we can all still add an edge discretion discretionary or automated uh, there is room for everyone and it takes a lot of and hard work me, the market's going to tell you very quickly if you've got it wrong you know <laughs> so that's what you got to recognize is when you got it wrong <laughs> um and, and just as a final thought uh linda um this year we're recognizing um uh, a great influencer in our industry mr wells wilder for for his lifetime achievement award um how much of an impact would you say uh, his work has had both in the industry, but also uh, in terms of indicators that you use as part of your methodology? What can you share with us on that point? Well, I think his early work, that one book in particular, he wrote where he detailed out uh, the, you know, the RSI and the ADX and volatility stop and reverse type of, of things. I think that that provided a super foundation, you know, in terms of he, he was an engineer. So he had that kind of mind, you know, that liked to, uh, you know, play with these linear relationships. He went off in other tangents later on. And I don't know if that was as much value to individuals, but I would think that everybody out there has used uh, one of the indicators he came up with at one time or another, you know, um, the ADX is just a wonderful way of seeing the smoothing, you know, of the highs and the lows relative to each other. So it brings your attention to the fact that you have a lot of price bar overlap. So that's what I actually, uh, you know, got out of it in the long run. Yes, it tells you when you've had a strong trending environment, but it also would be a way to scan, you know, if you wanted to say, uh, you know, I'm scanning for some price bar overlap. Um, I personally don't use the ADX anymore, but it was very insightful for me in terms of recognizing, ah, the chart formation, the amount of price bar overlap, here's a way that you can quantify it, you know, these types of things. Um, I do use uh, something every day on my charts, you'll see red and green uh, delineating the swings up and down, and that is directly based on his volatility stop and, re and reverse formula. So I would say that 90% of my modeling use a um, 
an average range function, average true range function, as opposed to say a standard deviation function. And so uh, with his volatility stop and reverse, that's based on, you know, average true range functions. You know, when the market moves up a certain amount off of a high or low, so, I mean, to me, that really uh, founded the core of, um, of my ability to quantify structure, you see? So, um, I think that's wonderful that you're recognizing him because, <clears throat> um, you know, his, his very early book, I think, was, was quite influential. Thank you very much, Linda. We appreciate your time and uh, look forward to watching your presentation live uh, at our IFTA online conference. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow morning.